Williams came to me one day. I don't see why this should be made public, as he frequently did. He says, Jane, I have a scholarship. What am I to do with it? It was natural for him to come to me to ask me. I had known him since he was a boy of 12. And I told him as follows. Bill, in my book, The Black Jacobins, you will see that the financial elements in France, particularly the people I have called the maritime bourgeoisie, were very sympathetic to the agitators against slavery. He said, yes, I've seen that in your book. I said, but take note, I didn't discover that. That's not a discovery of mine. I found that in the French historians who were writing about slavery. I said, but Bill in Britain, they're still talking about people who led the abolition, led it on account of the fact that they were subjectively hostile to the crime of slavery. But I am positive that in Britain you will find that the same economic and financial elements who were sympathetic and actively helped the movement in France, they are here in Britain. It hasn't been done in Britain. Go and do that, let that be your thesis. He says, you think that, that I say, I'm sure it is. I have looked at it, but I haven't done the work, but that's the work that has to be done. And Williams went, and he was a tremendous researcher, you know. And he did it in such a way that while people today are saying, well, it is not quite so, they have a lot of trouble. Good afternoon, Professor Kodja. Good afternoon, good having you here. We're very happy that you're able to talk to us today about the great intellectual scene, L.R. James from Trinidad. I have looked at your book before coming, James and his intellectual legacies. Okay. And I liked the chapters and how they're engaging with the work of James. Okay. But my purpose in doing this documentary is to shift the focus from literature and the arts to sociology. And I noticed that in your book, the emphasis because of your disciplinary background was in literary criticism. Not necessarily the sociological criticism is by social, I mean, Orlando Patterson, Campbell, and Spoken, yes. and uh, Cedric Maxwell. Yes. So there are a lot of the different passages. It's not just simply literary. I mean, literary is probably the least important. Mm -hmm. as the, there's works, for example, on cricket. Yes. So we try to cover the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole genre of James's work, as I understand it, if I remember, I've done it such a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I know that the areas, well, yes, that's quite true, I think. It's depend, of course, the first part is the uh, literary, mediali. Mm -hmm. the second part, back Jacobin's yes. uh, reassess and assessment. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got the political dimension, yes. his American years, mm -hmm. and you've got the philosophical dimension, which you can take, talk a bit about his epistemology. Mm -hmm. uh, then we talk about James's dialectics, you know, the notes yes. on dialectics. Yes. Then we do the theoretical dimension by Colinius uh, uh, Costarios, and he did, of course, Face in Reality. That was a very important work with James. Mm -hmm. He did it. And then, of course, Blackness and so So, if, of course, Cricket Marxism. Yeah. So, it's, it's a wide ranging book. I don't think it's true to say it's merely about it. No. The Black Jacobian, for example, took a literary theoretical approach to them primarily. So that I was surprised to go through, and only in one chapter did I find reference to political sociology? I think that's not true. I want to keep you at that. I don't think it's okay. true. I'm saying that Cedric uh, Maxwell, he's yes. an, another politician. Yes, I saw that. I saw that. In Castoriadis yes. is, of course, a theoretical man. He and James talked about the whole notion of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So it's not true to say it. Really, I don't think it's, it's Alex Dupree talks about Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, James reading of Toussaint, and we approach it in two ways, mm -hmm. in terms of James's figure in Toussaint as a literary hero, but of course, how James depicted Toussaint yes. was more in terms of an epic hero rather than, and of course, what James brought to bear, but he writes that in 1938, Black Jacobins, of course, he goes up to London in 32. Yes. He goes up there with a, a manuscript. Mm -hmm. The manuscript is published, mm -hmm. and so he brings to bear a sort of literary bent which he, it, so he doesn't write history in the ways that others write either history or, mm -hmm. or even um, philosophy. And, and so, right. I, so I, I, I want to insist it's not merely about literature. The point I'm making that James, even James himself, 
never, to my knowledge, used the word sociology to describe what he was doing. He talked about himself more as a historian, a dramatist of history. Uh, that's another phrase he used at some point. And when he goes into politics, it is purely political science, the way people read him. Okay. Whereas I'm trying to argue in this documentary that there is a lot of uh, sociological resonance in his work that we have not engaged with adequately. And I think Stewart Hall makes that point in James's Caribbean, in his uh, portrait of Stewart, uh, CLR, where he talks about celebrating him less and debating his work more and that's exactly what I want to do in this production from a sociological point of view and so I'm going to ask you about five questions broadly and one of them is obviously your work in his private life in his biography and how that biography connects with the history of his time you talk about Tuna Tuna Puna as a very symbolic location that gave birth to three giants of a Pan-African movement in your introduction to, to your book. So I'm, wonder <clears throat> I'm wondering if you can go over that ground for us again. Sidley Tagrigua, where I live right now, where you sit, is owned by the biggest slaveholder in Trent Tobago, his name was William Burnley have the most slaves in Trinidad. And in terms around 1840 or so, uh, or 1838 when slavery, uh, apprenticeship ended, the largest concentration of blacks in, in the country lived in this area. Yeah, by this area, I mean in the Tagrego Tunapuna area. Um, in that sense, if you look at places, I was speaking to a guy like Lloyd Best, and we were talking about why there's just so much, uh, such fervor there. It was second factor happened. You had some of the better, in terms of the sugarcane factories, you had pan boilers, you got very technical people, all coming from Barbados to produce. I mean, UWI where you are right now was a sugar estate. Mm -hmm. It was sugar estate. It sugar estate right down from San Juan right up to Ruka, Tarugo, Paradise. So you had a concentration of some of the most advanced theoretical people in terms of the advance in terms of the economy. You recognize that in the appendix of Black Jacobins, James talked about the whole notion of uh, the, that, that, that Af the Caribbean peoples were so very advanced at the time because they were the most ad advanced form of production, which was sugarcane production. In terms of Trinidad, the most advanced level of production was in this area, mm -hmm. the Tagarago, the Tunapuna area, and a concentration of black people. So in that sense, what James comes out of, James, Padmore, Sylvester Williams, and all, in fact, Sylvester Williams' father taught at Tagarigwesi. Many people don't know that. Mm -hmm. So then this is about, I taught at Tagarigwesi myself. Lloyd Best went to Tagarigwesi. Mm -hmm. So in that formation, that intellectual formation, also sociological formation, you have the production of a lot of people who not only had this uh, very advanced sugar culture, because Orange Grove made the best sugar crystal. Mm -hmm. They changed from the vacuum pan process in about 19, about, 1898 to go to the vacuum pan process had more molasses and the other process the vacuum pan process you had a lot of the crystals which is of course in terms of sugar making was a very advanced process it all took place here so they are coming out of that formation there's a second thing that's happening here in terms of the reading and like this is not my point it's so much Lloyd Best and as we're speaking he's, he's, he's just passed is that of course people read the Bible a lot there's a lot of reading, there. not that the Bible, not that so much the precepts of the Bible, but they were reading. She had really a very advanced uh, culture, very advanced sociological, and then of course later political culture. So that's what Lloyd Best comes out of, not Lloyd Best, that's what James comes out of. Nobody talks about that. They usually fix up James when he's in England someplace and he's written uh, Black Jacobins. But the whole intellectual formation that's taking place in these areas is seldom talked about. The school he went to mm -hmm. was built by slaves. Curiosity. Not curiosity. Tagarigwe is you in the Tagarigwe area. Forget curiosity. That comes in 1858. When they must train the uh, educated, when they, the, the civil servants and the least must train, to train their children, they send them to curiosity. I'm saying Tagarigwe, the slaves built Tagarigwe. It was even, it was only, a, is also an encomienda. So that's what you come on. Of course, I've done a small book on Tagarigwe, which goes in. It was one of the encomiendas. In fact, even before that, when of course they began to put together the Indians, when the Europeans came, 
and begin to move the Africans or this, they did, and put them in, not the Africans, the American Indians, and put them into a boat. There were four encomiendas of which Tagrig was one. So we've been there. In fact, Tagrig is probably the largest, the oldest village, about 250 years old. That's interesting. Is the school still existing? The intriguing thing about it, very interesting, that the school, uh, they moved from that old cocoa house, which I said was built by slaves, in 1954 mm -hmm. and went to the present school where it is right now. Eldorado? No, 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 it's just across the street. I mean, again, these are primary schools. Okay. And in this case, Anglican schools. Mm -hmm. Because after part of the big problem around the 1870s was to make them more Anglicized, more English, because it was a, a Catholic society under the French. Mm. And uh, we used to put it, it was an all purpose place. We did plays, we did Everything at the Tagrigo AC school because it had a big stage, it was a big auditorium, there was no classes cut up and so on. And when in point of fact uh, uh, they built the new school, we, the, a guy called Mr. Scott, who was the principal who in fact taught Lloyd Best and so on, uh, asked them to keep, asked the, 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 the pastor to keep the school so we could do our uh, recreational. And, and because it was a community center, and he went ahead and sold it to somebody who, who uh, bought curry. And I cast castigated him very much. Mr. Paffitt was a f the director very much for that. And some years later, I got a letter from his son, wow. who is now a, print a professor at the I think University of Manchester, saying that I sort of maligned his father. His father was very much a Trinidadian because his son was born. He went to school with us, and that his father had to great was very hurt in terms of having the school uh, sold, which of course was sold. I went and see him, we spent a good or two afternoons together talking about it. But the fact that now that school, that slave school was broken down and they now have a muffler place there. So a question that comes to my mind is, given the history of Takarekwa, the way you've explained it, how come we don't have many more Jameses, many more partners? In the, the nature of intellectual formations take different places. I mean, James and Williams and Padmore's are of a particular moment, a particular time. When James could say he could master, he was what they call the, the master, major scholar and master, all of those things, because knowledge was much smaller, knowledge base was much smaller. Same as with Williams and even uh, uh, Padmore. Now you've got the internet, no one could master. Now do you have that kind of knowledge base? Uh, in fact, they were of a particular time. More important, the challenges which they faced were quite different. It was colonialism, mm -hmm. which was a very clear enemy. And you could talk, for example, you go to James, I think, uh, a cell, a cell government, etc. Yes. What's the aim? Let's have more local men to run the country. Let's advance local men to higher jobs. Well, that's a very simple task. Mm -hmm. And then come James and Williams, and then, of course, let us uh, show the English and have our own country. And then let's have a federation. But the task of those for the, those were easy tasks which could be seen and accomplished mm -hmm. and of course gave a lot gave rise to a lot of rhetoric. Uh, after so this of course would be a point I think even Fanon makes, after independence the tasks are quite different. Yes. It's the tasks in this and themselves are much more fragmentary. And so you're not gonna have you're not gonna have a man of the king or Malcolm X because a Gamel Nasser. Because they embodied not only the movement, they embodied their times, they are persons of their times. But nothing lasts forever. The challenges are much, are much different now. And so you'll have much more fragmentary. Certainly, you go to news. You say, look at the news and you have CBS and they, everything happened today. Now you have mil hundreds of news channels, uh, channels. And so that this kind of monopoly and this kind of na uh, sort of um, holistic, organic, sort of uh, intellectuals, I don't want to use Gramsci's terms necessarily, but it's much more fragmentary. Even knowledge is so great. If you just to do, you talk about political sociology, etc. in those days they wouldn't be talking about political sociology. James would know very little about it. He loved the, the, uh, the soaps mm -hmm. because he talked about the fragmentary nature and he was the first to see the importance of the lives of people to the soaps and so on. But James would not be talking about psychoanalysis. He would not be talking like Lacan. That wasn't part of his vocabulary. Nor was it Williams' vocabulary. Nor was it Padmore's. It was, small, it was a smaller world. So I think it has to do with the historic moment. And you have a different kind of intellectual arising of this particular historical and social formation. If you look at prior to James, there were other kinds of uh, uh, intellectuals. But James and Williams and Padmore are of their times. They, we are in a new time now, and that's going to call for a whole different kind of way of 
looking at the social phenomenon. James, uh, in his what I call his historical sociology, makes the claim that great men make history, but not always. That's that's not James. He applied the materialist methodology of Marx in a very rigid way in terms of, of course trying to interpret what he did and of course when he broke with the Soviet Union in terms of state socialism mm -hmm. and of course even with Trotsky he recognized that one had to be more creative in the use of these categories mm -hmm. as I think uh, most serious theorists begin to understand. So James, yes he used it as a base. They took uh, Marx's notion of epistemology and how you understand phenomenon and took it a step further and made it much, much, much more creative. Yes, I'm thinking about the Black Jacobins uh -huh. and how he applied the historical materialist conception mm -hmm. of history mm -hmm. to that uh, revolution. Mm -hmm. What does it say to us today as students of sociology? What would you regard as the most important contribution he made to historical sociology in that work? What do you call it historical sociology? Why don't you find the term for me so I can be more precise? Maybe yeah, maybe we'll call it simply history, but it wasn't history as in the narration of events and personalities, but also a theoretical approach to history that you don't find in history that you will. Well, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, uh, E.H. Carr, mm -hmm. his book What is History? And uh, certainly uh, the, the historians of consciousness mm -hmm. coming out of California were saying something quite different. That in fact, they look for, I guess, the noumenon mm -hmm. and then uh, look for a so it manifests itself in the phenomenon. Uh, but Black Jacket is important, I think, because what it did, I think the first claim to be made for Black Jacobins, it's in a way, it described the Haitian Revolution as a part of the completion of the working people's revolution. In other words, I think the correct way to see black Jacobins, if you look at the American Revolution of 1776 as the overthrow of that colonial class and the removal of the divine rights of kings and the fact that people, that's what a republic is, that people must be in control of their own destiny. And that's further strengthened by the French Revolution of 1789 you remember they talk about li liberty, equality, fraternity. And the American Revolution talk about the fact that we are born with certain inalienable rights. But the contradiction is that black people were still enslaved. And what James did, he carried through, what Toussaint did, he carried through that revolution to say that people, be they black, white, pink, or hence black Jacobins, mm -hmm. are in fact entitled to control their own affairs. What James tried to show is that the, that, that was the completion of that revolutionary process that was begun with the American Revolution. The first, that's, I think, the first and major claim. Secondly, in Black Jacobin, he says very, very clearly that Toussaint was probably, I think, with the exception of Napoleon, the, the greatest man of his time. Why was he the greatest man of his time? He understood what his role must be and what he must do to free his people. Of course, he didn't carry the revolution right through because Dessalines had to kind of complete it. And part of it is that Toussaint equivocated because he also wanted to stay true to the French in the sense of their values. And Dessalines saying, for example, forget it, we're going to be free at any cost. So in terms of your sociological historical notion, I think the importance of that work is to demonstrate that in point of fact, that oppressive systems fall and that people, given their sovereignty and their power, could overthrow those obstacles that are in their way. And what James does, I think, is to demonstrate that in fact how events, as you said, the Marx position, how events either catapults people into action. Of course, this guy was a slave, he was a coach driver, and then the oh my my little king, he was there sitting home and saying, Rev, let's go see about this bus. So people, men make history, yes. Mm -hmm but not as they please, but under conditions that are poured for, for them. I think you could say something about Eric Williams or anyone else. Yes. yes, I think he made that point that the revolution made to say. Oh yes, oh yes. To and vice versa, and <laughs> Tucson made a revolution, it's a dialectic. CLR was too much of uh, an, an enlightenment man uh, that his education probably, but definitely hit the focus of his theory was if you like Eurocentric. That's nonsense. And nonsense. to some extent, therefore, that he did not understand any African 
thinking processes that influence this uh, Sana Domingo revolution? Is that a fair critique? Mm -hmm. People write as they must on what they have at the time. Mm -hmm. When James wrote that the major, I think Bernard Moyd speak about that. James had to go to the French archives. Look at look at uh, writings from the 17 whatever, written in hand, mm -hmm. and just to get the information, just to get the story out. No now, system. necessarily, you can never say everything about any revolution since the beginning of such a large process. For example, Carolyn Flick, for example, in her work says James didn't give me much attention to the Maroons who played a very important part of the revolution. But it's just simply emendation. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make him Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. James is Eurocentric with the fact, if you want to call it that. He believed in the ideas of the Enlightenment, yes, and democracy. That doesn't make him anti-anything. Mm -hmm. It simply says he was a man of his time. And he was about the project, the, the project of humanity. But the same guy who worked and went and worked with Nkrumah, and gave years to Nkrumah, the same guy who came to Trinidad and worked with Williams, the same guy who formed the Workers and Farmers Party. So I think that is sort of retros reading James retrospectively in terms of what you'd like to see in him rather than dealing with the task which he faced. Even the notion of Afrocentricity only comes in the 50s in light of the Black Revolution and those things. Who was the revolution? Okay, forget J, uh, forget Malcolm, forget Garvey, forget uh, Carter G. Woodson. But the very nature of the thing, nothing before its time. So to ask James, I mean, what are we supposed to say? Talk more about the, uh, the, 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 the Mali and the Egyptian kingdom? That's what he wasn't about. Mm -hmm. He was a Marxist. He believed in dialectics. He understood the interrelation of things. He believed in the power of the working class, which knows in dialectics. That's his forte. He's not a, and of course, in his forte, he talks about the importance of class over race. Even those water says in, um, in his book on, um, on uh, how you're going to develop Africa, which he quotes James. But there were times James recognized when race supersedes class, as in places in the States in South Africa. So that's a, I, I don't accept, that's retrospectively reading. We all get bright after the fact, <laughs> but I don't think it's correct to say that. Yes, I think you're right in the sense that uh, what uh, James brought to Marxist theory of history was his emphasis on race. No, his emphasis on culture. Yes. Culture. They, they, and, and until that time, people dismissed the soap, op the soap operas. Yes. Yeah, they even miss this because remember the Marxists in terms of Marxists being even talking about Soviet Marxists mm -hmm. was a very rigid Marxism, yes. very very rigid. In terms of culture, wasn't a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Psychology wasn't a big part of it. it was a very a standard, almost turgid kinds of Marxism that's very rigid, mm -hmm. superstructure, base. And you have to take people like Gramsci and others to begin to clean it up. Mm -hmm. So that James and others are there. Even, I mean, why, for example, did Padmore leave the Communist Party and, 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 and go and work for black, and support black people? Because the, the, the Marxism at the time couldn't absorb the American, the American Communist Party. So these are structural limitations that are products of their specific time and place. Mm -hmm. And you could just, you got to locate someone in his time and his place and what he's doing be on the boundary uh -huh. as a piece of uh, sociology of sport and yeah. sociology of art. Yeah, There's yes. a lot of music in yeah. it. Yeah. And I would like you to, again, point out to us what you see as James's major gift to the sub-discipline of sociology of art. What James recognized, that cricket was not just cricket. It reflected a way of life. Mm -hmm. It was a way by which and through which the colonizer inculcated his values into the subjects. And what James was saying that cricket, I mean, you have to play a straight bat. You wore white. You never questioned the empire decision. These were rules which trained you to behave in a certain way. And so that work became very important, almost classic. I think it's not almost, it is classic. Because it recognized that games and sports are not merely games and sports. They really are a reflection of a culture and it was a major bridge for the time because we saw culture as culture and sports as sports. There was never no correlation between sports and life mm -hmm. and how one informs the other and shapes the others. I think that's James' great gift. And he recognized him in terms of different kinds of clubs. Like I, 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 I we, when I was growing up, I mean, James was Maple, we were Malvern, but well, James is, I mean, it's his generation, but my generation. But they, they represent class formations. Mm -hmm. If you're a guy who's really struggling and, you know, in the ghetto or whatever, you want to support Malvern. The nice elite class uh, supported Maple. So even in the games, even in the clubs, 
the, and he, there was a what is the club he talked about, which those guys are uh, very strong on. It represented certain class attitudes. So I think that's the major breakthrough of Beyond a Boundary. Mm -hmm. There is a description by Stewart Hall that I read in a chapter in this book, James's Caribbean, where he talks about the painting. That's the book by um, by Paul Buell. And, yes, Buell. Uh, Paul yes. And, uh, yes, I'm the point made by Stewart is that CLR had a painting, a postcard of Guernica by Picasso. Oh, that was big in his life. Oh, Guernica was very big in his life. Did you discuss that with him? No, I didn't discuss it with him. But it was very, very big for him. No, I never discussed it. Okay. And the first chapter in your book also talks about a certain painting on his desk in London that he was always studying and finding new dimensions to. Is that the same painting on the cover of your book? Well, this painting was done by a woman and we used this painting, though it's not the same painting at all. Okay. It's quite a different painting and I don't remember all the details of it now. It's, I mean, I interviewed James in 1980, I think, mm -hmm. uh, 82. In fact, I want to write something on James in terms of a book. We never, that was about 20 something years ago. So, okay. is that, but the point is that he was always reading music and art was very important to him. Mm -hmm. The way he interpreted Dick Tracy yeah. in his study the of the American civilization. Yeah. Uh, they are very insightful and kind of contrary to the distinction between low art and high art. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. James is very good about that. He saw that. Mm. He saw that. You know, we talk about it in philosophy, we talk about the noumena and the phenomena. Mm -hmm. We talk about the surface, we talk about the essence, mm -hmm. we talk about the accidents. James cut to the noumena. He cut to the essence. So we read that in the book looking at it. We say, okay, today I'll tell you about X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. And he talks about X, Y, Z, six to the point. Because he had a very incisive mind. It was tremendously well read. But he stuck to the point. And that comes from a certain degree of uh, intellectual discipline. He was very disciplined mm -hmm. intellectually. Yes. And of course, knew what he wanted to say. Uh, you know, sometimes I think he was wrong, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think he was just great. Yes, Melville as Shakespeare, it uh, sounds like pushing it a bit. Well, in terms of the epic struggle between the whale <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, what the whale the represents, whaler, yes. and that, of course, that I think you would probably say that the whaler and that epic is analogous in the 19th century to the kinds of epic struggles that we have earlier on. Mm -hmm. And remember that, of course, is that I think he talks about the almost maniacal, diabolical nature of this totalitarian society which has been forced. So I think he used it metaphorically, mm -hmm. which I think is probably one way of reading the text. Yes, I think I read somewhere about his uh, defense or rather appeal against being deported from America. Oh yeah. Suggesting that he is more American than the people deporting him. Well, I mean, interestingly enough, <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows this, the two versions of that book, I said two versions. The original version, in the last chapter, mm -hmm. which I read, I'm sure you can find it someplace. James doesn't want to leave America. He doesn't even want to come back to Trinidad. Because remember, he got there in 1938, has lived there till 1954, that's how many years, a great part of his life. Mm -hmm. He's become Americanized. Remember when he got to England, he lived in England for six years, yes. from 32 to 38. You go to America, you're there from, from 38 to 54, which is about close to 20 years. Mm -hmm. You are American in terms of sensibility and all, I mean, even though he left here very early, he left here about 32. And he had no place to go back to. He I mean, remember, he was Constantine, Larry Nicholas Constantine, one who took care of him and all that kind of good stuff, but Constantine is down here with the party, the PNM and so on. So he had four more friends in the US of A, had a much more, a, a big, bigger standing in the sense of people support him and so on and so forth. So he didn't really want to go back. Mm -hmm. And the intriguing thing is that when the second volume came out, when it was uh, it probably, they removed that last paragraph, that last uh, paragraph, not paragraph, chapter, which is making a tremendous appeal why he should stay in America, and why in fact, not so much he's more American, but why he more embodies the ideal of the American civilization than the others. I mean, remembers McCarthy, mm -hmm. remembers a kind of diabolical, kind of very maniacal, very ignorant kind of folks dealing with, reducing everything in a very, Di you know, di di dichotomous manner, mm. good, bad, evil, whatever, whatever. And James said, no, listen, I may criticize you, but I don't criticize because I hate you. I believe in your values, mm -hmm. but part of the freedom must be my ability to say what I don't like. Mm -hmm. So it's in that sense, I think I want to read that appeal 
to stay in the country and so on. In Beyond the Boundary, where he wrote about his dilemma being invited to join a light skinned cricket yeah. team and uh, or join a black skinned cricket team, but he eventually chose to go with the light skinned team. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that say about his uh, perception of ethnic conflict? Or it says nothing. Or race? It says him? nothing. Nothing? But it's not about ethnic conflict. I think yes. it says nothing about that. Yes. Uh, if that's the question, yes. it says nothing about that. If you're asking me, how could one interpret that? Yes. I think the way you interpret it suggests that James, I said that James was about class rather than race. Mm -hmm. And James was always about a line in a long class line. Yes. And of course, always looking because cricket to him was the was almost the quintessential moment. Mm -hmm. So you'll be looking for what team you could probably best work with or fellas if you have more friends there or whatever. Because remember, at a certain point, and don't get idealistic about it, let's go back to materialism mm -hmm. and your sociological analysis. In 1932, or say 1930, James is reading, he talked about how much times he read Thackeray and his re James is a reading man. How many people have been reading Thackeray, but even reading at all? <laughs> so therefore, you're going to select your friends. With whom would you come, not because, it, it, it's not a racial di 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 dynamo, di dialectic. You don't just go hang with the black guys because they're black. Mm -hmm. Because once you begin to read and have ideas, and reading Cipriani, he writes about Cipriani, and having a lot of ideas, he talks about the books which come to his house. There's a class kind of, if you want to call it a bourgeois, a bourgeois conscious, all right, I don't have a problem with that, or semi bourgeois that's all right, but it's not ethnic. We should not collapse into an ethnic problem. It's not an ethnic problem. It's here someone having gone and did, done certain things and had an interest in things. He wants to hang with the people who are doing those things. Yes. And remember, in that time, the question of race is not a, a major dynamic here. In trying to be able to race, is, we have been a very cosmopolitan country. You got Indians, you got Chinese, you got Portuguese, etc. So the, the racial dynamic, I must tell you, when I went to the States, I mean, I know I was black in some sort of, you know, uh, mental way. It's only when I got to the States I realized I was really black. Mm. Because I was treated differently. But here you weren't aware of that. I mean, certain segments did. So this consciousness of blackness is a recent phenomenon in a mass way. In the sense that you'd have it with Malcolm and those kinds of guys. So I would not read. Don't again, I think we have to regard against re reading retrospectively into James rather than taking James at his time and his place. It says absolutely nothing. We used to have guys hanging at the corner. Mm -hmm. My friends, when I was young, 20 guys, we talking about Malvern and Maple. One we know is a middle class clean, one's a regular clean. And my friends, some like Malvern, some like Maple. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. We never saw it in those racial terms. I mean, I've seen them in class terms. Mm -hmm. They're too good for us, or something like that. But not in racial terms. So to me, it says very little about uh, uh, James's ethnic. There was no conflict there to me. No. More class rather than race. Yeah, it's interesting, because he titled that chapter The Lighter and the Darker. Mm -hmm. And later, Constantine was telling him in London that if he had joined the Darker team, they would have made a cricket out of him, which means the Darker team was probably the better team, but the Lighter Skin team was probably higher class than the darker one. But I just said it was class, but what's the point? So he chose to join a higher class team rather than a lower class. But one. you see, you, you, you're collapsing the phenomenon. You're not thinking through the phenomenon. James would not. If you accept my position mm -hmm. as an intellectual, a guy who's reading, he used to talk about going to the music with Carlton Common, listening to music. The certainly traveled in had to like, like interests. The circles you had like interests. Those who were either probably black or whatever didn't have the same interests. Just don't go to somebody and hang them because you're black. Mm -hmm. Since so in 1930, you hang them because you share the same interests. So, for example, when I come back here, yes, I have friends who I'm going to talk about. If I want to talk about Lacan, not now, let's suppose 20 years ago. I was in job at University because I was talking Marxism. Who you talk with? I come back here with this major, this is my home. I come back. I can't talk to my neighbors about Lacan and Freud and, 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 and I'm sure I'm going to talk about that. Talk. Here we're going to call, hey boy, what's going on, boy? You all right? How do you fall and all kind of thing? You got to talk about that because that's what they know. 
They don't understand. So if I then go and have with some friends who are talking my language, am I being, am I dissing them racially? And I think that's the, we cannot, again, do not collapse that thing and read it retrospectively. No, Constance couldn't possibly know that. There's no way to know that, by the way. Mm. Maybe a, bad, a better cricketer or a worse cricketer. I don't know, who did Constantine play with? Lighter guys or higher guys? Right? <laughs> played in England. Mythology. <laughs> Let's look at James here. we got to be careful. I mean, we... Sailor James, uh, Triumph. Um, he told one Michel Maxwell Philip. This is a black guy who was recognized in a solicitor general. Mm -hmm. In 1888, he's the only one to talk about the importance he was not given this position because of race. But here's the piece I want to look at. Uh, the Intelligence of the Negro, Selah James. Look at right here. The same man you saying to black people. Look at right here. Mm -hmm. 227. The first, they have not read James. They just, again, this is James here. 227. The Intelligence of the Negro. And he's, uh, in the last issue of the Beacon, the Pale by Sidney C. Holland, entitled Race at Mixture. And he goes on to attack him on the question of, so how many men know about race? Mm. He's right here. So that's not true. Okay. I mean, it's a more complex kind of person having to try and deal with certain kinds of different realities. Mm. And remember also that when he went to England mm -hmm. and he met Padmore, they begin to fight for that Afri for African... Yes. yes, they did. All right, so go ahead. My argument is that, you know, the critique of Hegel by Marx was a thorough critique. And... Uh, critique based on principle that if you're an idealist you would follow Hegel into certain kinds of premises whereas if you're a materialist then you would adopt a different approach to politics and to history but what uh, James allegedly got from Hegel was to emphasize again the importance of culture the people who wrote about dialectics was Hegel mm -hmm. All right, where Hegel got his dialect is in fact the question of the, the bo slavery and bondage, mm -hmm. Hegel's major work, which he got from the French Revolution. All right, he didn't get it from Hegel and Marx, he got it from the French, and I could give you the article by Susan Buck Morris. Okay. Anybody wonder where, how could Hegel talk about um, the question of um, uh, bondage and freedom and all that kind of stuff? 1808. Hegel. Of course, it became reactionary when around 1828, which is, it has a part of Hegel the court. Mm -hmm. But my point is, if you want to talk about dialectics, you got to go to the start. You got to go to Hegel. If you're talking about Marx, you got to go to who? Marx. Now, what a creative intelligence does, and this is where Martin James is very creative. When he talks on notes on dialectics, what do you think he said to me was going to be as good as a book? What he's trying to do, for example, he tries to talk about the working class as being the, the major phenomenon and try to talk about how that works out in real terms. So he starts with a base, yes, but then he puts his own spin on it. But to say he should not go back there doesn't really make much sense. He has to go back there because those are the people who are talking about it. And you know, if I actually do a thesis on James or Naipaul, you've got to read everything that Naipaul wrote. Anybody wrote about Naipaul? That's where you start. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do the same thing that he does. So I don't know that, again, these are, I don't see this being criticisms. I mean, I, I suspect Paul put it probably in a different kind of way. But no, I think James had to go back to, and he mastered, I mean, and he prided himself on that, mm -hmm. on mastering the masters. Yes. And from that, he, that's why he could write Beyond a Boundary. That's why he could write Black Jacobins, mm -hmm. because he had studied these guys very well and could talk about them. So I would look at it in that way. In what way did he approach Hegel critically? The most fissant nature of Hegel is his early period when he's looking at the Haitian Revolution yes. and reading all the articles about it. I'm telling you, go to Critical Inquiry and read Susan Buck Morris' article, uh, article on it. Okay, Buck, okay. Susan Buck Morris. So I think I find that most of the people who critique these guys have not read them thoroughly. They pick up something that Hegel say and say Hegel says also oh, forget Hegel, hmm. not recognizing that they're different. Phases. What do you think about his critique of uh, Nkrumah and Gave in particular? James went to Ghana. Yes. James knew Gave. James knew Nkrumah even when they were in the United States. Mm -hmm. They worked together. And when he went to Ghana, well, I could take one criticism they make of, 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 of Nkrumah. Because remember, Nkrumah was overthrown. Mm -hmm. His very people overthrow him. Yes. Because yeah. they probably thought he was moving very quickly. When you go into a culture, if you're part of that culture, you can't move too far beyond the people. 
what Nkrumah was doing, he was disregarding the fundamental cultural things of his people. You can't do that. That's what James could do. Yeah, but it wasn't the people who overthrew him, it was the army. It was the United States. Yes. So? <laughs> But when you try to come back, what happened? You see, what my point is, it's not in a, in, in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. The point is, yes, Milton Ob Obote was overthrown by the United States, mm -hmm. as was Kwame and Kuma. In fact, I talked to two ambassadors who were there in the United States at the time. I knew them both, Williams and Clyde Ferguson. I knew them both. They were wrong. He would criticize them, and I suspect, again, you look at the, 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 the careers of these two people, you see what happened, and maybe James was not, even Walter. Maybe he was not that, that, was, he was not that incorrect in light of Evans. How do we know? What happened? Mm -hmm. What do you think is his most important contribution to education of you? It seems to me the way to look at James is quite an intellect. When James came back, you look at some of the end reviews, for example, of the Nation, he wrote for the Nation when he came back from Antigua, which was the Penal Weekly. And this day was to reproduce Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, his book, to make reading available, make literature available to all of the people. He believed in that. He was, in that sense, very egalitarian and very much a Democrat wanted to um, educate people and have them learn. But remember the one thing about James was about ideas. James never had to run a school. Maybe before he left he used to give some lessons. He never had to run a country. So at James it remains at the level of ideas. One of the intriguing things about intellectuals and theorists, remember James never led, led a party or group or formation of more than 30 or 40 people or 50 people and they always break them and go into new factions. So the long, the long kind of work, which I think is where William, what Williams had over him, and working on a day in, day out basis to create something, I don't think James had much of that experience. And so while one could talk about revolution and change people in the street and all that stuff, it sounds good. And I think that James would put a very high price on education in the workplace and maybe workers' control and that kind of stuff. It does not take away from formal education in terms of learning the laws of physics, chemistry, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, James would be very egalitarian. He'd very much in terms of learning about your own society. He'd very much in talk about talking about the, um, the ascendancy and the privileging of the working people. But also the great, he had a great love for bourgeois culture mm -hmm. in terms of music and Chopin and, mm -hmm. you know, and the great, uh, and Mac, Mac, Michelangelo and all that. So again, you may call it contradictory. So that was the contradiction there. But I think the even larger contradiction would be that he never really had to um, put, it in, put it in work. You know, like for example, we have an organization called the National Association. There's one thing about talking about bringing black people together, right? And we have to have in Trinidad Diego, there's no black out. But how do you keep that sustain it, sustain that on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you do that? I could talk about oh, there's a need for a black organization and I mean liberate black people to do that. Oh yeah, I talk about that, not a problem. It doesn't take much. But once you get on the ground and have to organize an organization and pay for the rent and pay for the phone and pay for the whatever, it's a whole different question. And I think therein lies the contradiction in the sense that while James was a great thinker, there had no point in James's life. In fact, I don't even know James ever worked. In fact, I had Constance Webb and I had, not Constance Webb, um, the philosopher, Miss Lee, what Lee is she? Uh, the three of them who were in this Jensen Farrington, I forget what Lee she is. She was a philosopher, philosopher from, Col from um, Columbia. We talk a lot about that. James never worked. In point of fact, as much probably had money he had came out with Williams in terms of how you get money. The talk is so as being spent. We talked about that. I think I did a lecture once on the whole James and women. So that, so I mean, it gotta be, we've been idealistic. We love James because it's nice and ideal. Mm -hmm. But in terms of practical terms, the organization, translating ideas to practice, that's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. In Trent Tobago, at least, I think he's known much better over the world. I remember when James died, I came to the funeral. Mm -hmm. I flew in from London to the funeral. Um, I think David Abdullah from OWT called me and told me James had died. And I flew in just for the funeral. And it was held at OWTU. Mm -hmm. And uh, David Rudder was there. I know he sang Sparrow Song. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dave Garkas Howe was there too, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. I guess that's 200 people. 200 people? That was it. Wow. And then we took the, the, the bus, whatever, we took cars and all that stuff. And we got to Tunapuna, of course, where he lived. Mm. Have you seen it where he's buried? No. You should go there and take a shot of it. I'll show it to you at some point. Yeah. And then we took him there and I walked, I was even walking with his wife. Mm -hmm. But there were not many people who knew James was. Two or three hundred people. If that many, I think there was a lot. 
it wasn't that more than Mark Scott at his oh. <laughs> And maybe that's 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 so in that sense mm. it's important that we let people know what he was and try that. But we are not in the society very much into that kind of stuff.